Welcome to StarX's campus demo day. Uh, my name is Cameron Teitelman. I uh, founded StarX a couple years ago. Uh, I'm currently the CEO. Um, so, StarX, I want to come out and give you a, a few minutes on why we exist. Um, we're not here kind of just to give free resources to companies. Um, there was kind of a, a really big pain point when we started. When we started, we realized that for founders at a Stanford, there are a lot of resources all over the place that uh, can actually be really useful, but they're not really organized. And the most important thing when you're building a company is for you to optimize your time and focus on the things that are important. And so what we do at StartX through our program is we help you organize all these resources that help you focus on what you need to be working on and then we help you solve the problems that are right in front of you over the next couple of weeks. Um, now, in our initial research, we realized that um, there is a very clear pattern between the founders who are very successful out of Stanford, who are successful multiple times and built a lot of companies, who are successful once, and the ones who fail. We talked around 220 to figure this out. And what we do is we help founders recreate some of the same success and some of the same support ecosystems that these successful Stanford alums created. Now, something interesting that some of you may not know is that Stanford alumni founded companies create around 2.7 trillion in annual revenue, and that makes it the 10th largest world economy. Wow, right? Like Stanford alum, just Stanford alumni founded companies. Um, we feel and we believe that a better organization of that ecosystem, a better focus of that ecosystem, can significantly increase the amount of GDP is that, that's created. So our goal is to get all the best Stanford founders in one community and help them reach their potential over the course of their careers. So we have founders that have gone through our program once, exited, gone through again. We have people who are 10 years out and have already built successful companies that are now part of our community. Um, and so as you'll see today, there are a lot, there's a lot of diversity. Um, and one of the things that Stanford is really well known for and is very powerful when you're building a company is this interdisciplinary environment. And we have a lot of companies in biotech, and enterprise, software, and medical devices that share insights across these industries and are able to come up with really innovative solutions. So today you'll kind of see a spectrum of that. Um, and uh, we have an amazing lineup, so I'm very excited for that, and some awesome speakers. Luke Nostic, the co-founder of PayPal, and Jerry Yang, the co-founder of Yahoo, found this company here. Um, so with that, We'll get started, and I'm going to uh, ask Brian to come out. And Brian was a volunteer on the StartX team for about two years, and then recently joined full-time. Now, the StartX team is actually a group of around 10 full-timers and 30 volunteers. Um, we started as, a, as part of a student government at Stanford and spun out as a separate entity. And Brian will talk about our current relationship with Stanford. Um, but a lot of what we do is on the... Um, with the passion of volunteers that are currently Stanford students. And that's an amazing experience, and applications are, applications are open, so um, whether you're a founder, a student who wants to volunteer on our team, a mentor or an alum, there's a way for you to get involved. So with that, I'm going to ask Brian to come out. Thank you. All right, greetings, friends. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday. This is one thing I love about being a part of the Stanford community is on the first weekend of classes on a beautiful Saturday, we have a bunch of people inside learning about business and entrepreneurship. What a great place to be. So Cameron just said, StartX isn't about just giving away free resources, but that's what I'm about. So let's just start with giving away a few free pieces of swag. Don't worry, I played high school baseball. Let's see what I can make work here. There's one. Balcony, not going to happen. I need one of those guns. So thanks again, thanks everyone for coming out to Campus Demo Day. If you're tweeting, if you're talking about us on Facebook, here are the plugs for us right here. Write them down, talk about your experience here. As always, we have to start by thanking the organizations that really help StartX exist. These are the companies, these are our strategic partners. Not only do they support StartX financially and allow us to operate, because if we're not taking equity in companies, we're not charging them a thing, not doing IP capture, how do we exist? How do we make money? And it's from these great strategic partners. And when I say a strategic partner, 
They're not just offering money, but each one of these organizations has talent and expertise of interest and of value to the companies going through our programs, and they support our companies directly as well. And how can I start without talking about some of the people that made this event possible? So we have one exclusive event sponsor, paid for all of your food, so thanks, thank them if you see it, and that's Hyundai Motor Group. We also have an academic sponsor in the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, and as always, Stanford Student Enterprises helped us get the word out. And we were SSE Labs before we were StartX, so they're always a friend of ours. I do want to give our, our sponsors a few minutes to address the crowd, so up first, we have John with Hyundai Motor Group and also a two-time graduate of Stanford University. Thanks, John. Um, at, first, at first, if I can, it's about 24 years ago, which I know if you're an undergraduate, it was before you were born, if you're a recent graduate, you might also have been very young. And at, at this spot, it used to be um, a parking lot. And, and when I was here, I was on the Stanford cycling team, and this was used to be um, a bike racing course. So I really am amazed to see the change in, at this university. And when I, when I think about StartX, you know, I, what, I, what I think about is the inverse of a treasure map. And in a treasure map, as you know, you have an X that marks the treasure spot. But I think StartX is the exact opposite, where well, that X is, is you, the entrepreneur, or, or the, you know, the founder, where the, the X is your treasure, it's your idea, it's your passion, it's your vision for something being different. And what I like about the StartX program is a way to take you from that X into into the periphery, into, into a place where you have value, or you have, a, or you have a product or service that really has meaning and impact in, in the greater world. And so what I'm really thrilled about to be not only a sponsor for today, but hopefully a partner in the longer term is that Hyundai Motor Group would also like to partner with you in your journey to take that idea, your treasure, and into something greater. And in a place like Stanford, and, and this graduate business school is beautiful. I mean, it's a gorgeous campus, and it's a beautiful day. And I want to encourage you to think about, uh, in, in here it's easy to maybe not get lost on some of the problems, the pains, the struggles in this world. So as you take that journey into, into success, what I really encourage you is to not to think about the hard problems. So on your way to making those insanely great products, I hope you will also uh, do your best to solve some insanely hard problems. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you, John. Thank you, Hyundai Motor Group. Up next, we're going to have Leah from the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies address the crowd for just a second. We have them to thank for getting us this lovely space this afternoon. Thank you, Leah. Stanford, uh, 
actually the, the community dedicated to the support of entrepreneurs. That's really what we are at our heart. Before an accelerator, we are a community that we've built that is dedicated to the development and acceleration of entrepreneurs. We do this with a great staff, a great group of alumni. We also do it with a huge list of mentors, serial entrepreneurs, industry leaders throughout Silicon Valley. And unlike other accelerators, as you know, we don't take any equity, we don't charge. Our programs are academic in nature, and we're concerned only with providing you value, developing you as an entrepreneur, and not trying to take value away from that experience. So what does our accelerator do? First and foremost, we have, like I said, that community dedicated to supporting you. And what does that mean? It means any person in that community can ask any other person in that community for help, and they will say yes. That's what we've built. The best people in Silicon Valley helping the entrepreneurs go through our community and a dedicated team there to, to support them. Like I just mentioned, we have great mentors. We have multiple mentorship programs for people hands-on working with our companies every week. So just those one-off experience with some of the best experts we have in the Bay Area. Obviously, one thing that we do very well is our educational programs. In each session, and we run three three-month sessions a year, except StartX Med is six months. In each one of those three-month sessions, we have about 80 different events. Some of these are social, but most of them are figuring out what our companies need to learn and in real time, customizing an educational experience for them. And lastly, we provide a lot of great resources. Companies that go through our program can access about $100,000 or more in free or reduced price resources. And of course, they can work out of our lovely new office just, like I said, a half mile off campus. So some quick facts and figures in our history since the summer of 2010. We've been able to support 450 different founders. That represents 191 different companies. And these companies are having success. On average, they're, they're raising 2.2 million per company. And we've had 18 acquisitions during that time period as well. So they're going out into the market, they're having a lot of validation, a lot of success, and we're very proud of them for that. We just finished our summer session. Last week's uh, Investor Demo Day closed out that session. It was our largest session to date. We had 32 brand new companies go through our accelerator. And look at some of these statistics. They came in, 60% of them were revenue generating, uh, the highest one having two million in revenue. But one thing that's changed over the years from us now is we're seeing a lot of these companies already come in with funding. We had 36 million already raised from our class as they came in. But of course, one thing StartX does very well with our companies is help them raise more capital to advance the development of their business. So during the session, they raised another 37 million, including 15.5 from one of our companies. These are some of our recent um, acquisitions as well. Like I said, we've had 18 over the years, and that's a number we anticipate will continue to grow. One new thing, we are now at the one-year anniversary of the Stanford StartX Fund. Now, for the first time, StartX, in collaboration with Stanford, has an investment vehicle to support our StartX companies when they're fundraising. Now, this is not a requirement to get into our program. Our program still takes zero equity. We created the fund to help our companies fundraise. So when they're already about to start fundraising, they think they can raise about a half a million, or a, yeah, about a half a million dollars, and at least 30 of that is professional investors, then the Stanford StartX Fund will come in as well and bump their round out 10%. So now our companies can go around and talk to investors and say, I have Stanford StartX supporting me as well. But again, Ooh. yeah, that's right. <laughs> We've had a ton of success. In one short year, we've done 68 investments in 58 different companies. So we also do follow-on rounds. And that's about a third of our entire community now has access to fund to help develop and accelerate their, their business. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we also have, oh, this place is lovely, I love your going, I love going here every day. A brand new home, we have nearly 13,000 square feet that is ours. For the first time, StartX has its own home. We have two floors, we have a flexible event space. And one great thing we also have for the first time on site is a wet lab, and we're about to open a hardware electronics prototyping lab as well. So now our StartX Med companies and our hardware companies can do some of their work on site and just a stone's throw away from Stanford's campus. Now, the final thing I have to say to you guys today, especially for the entrepreneurs and the founders in this room, our applications are open. Please apply. 
Also, if you're interested in supporting the entrepreneurial community we built here at Stardex, apply to join our team. Like Cameron said, when I was in law school here, that's exactly what I did. I applied to be a volunteer, and now I'm here full time. They couldn't get me to leave. So, apply with your company, apply to work here. And if you're interested in either of those things, whether it's volunteering or working with Stardex or having your company go through our accelerator program, this Monday we have an info session on campus. Come by our booth afterwards for more details, but in that we'll do a full rundown on everything that we expect from companies that go through our programs and what we expect of volunteers and employees that come and help Stardex. So that's all I have for the Stardex pitch. And now let's get to our first speaker. Our first speaker this afternoon, as Cameron said, is Luke Nosek. Luke is a co-founder of PayPal. Uh, while he was there, he was the vice president of marketing and strategy. He helped release some of their most profitable products. And now today, he continues to help and support entrepreneurs grow and develop through the always innovative work at the Founders Fund. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Luke Nosek. Thank you, everybody. I'm honored here to speak and share some of my thoughts with you at Stardex and help you continue your very important work in building the next generation of great companies and mentoring the next generation of, of great companies in, in the world. And I also um, want to say that Peter Thiel really was going to be speaking first, but he is out on his book tour for Zero to One, which encapsulates much of our knowledge of founders from building great companies. <coughs> you should order it, you should read it. Um, and it can help you a lot with building your company. But what I'm going to speak about today isn't about your startup. What I'm actually going to speak about and start a conversation about is how you are the most important startup and how you can be, you can build that and why it's quite important. Here's what I mean by this. Um, with Founders Fund, first of all, as a, as a preface, we like to have our founders uh, running our companies for the long haul. So if the founder is not successful and they're not able to, to continue with the company, we consider that a failure. We believe that the greatest companies, the ones that have an impact on, on human life, a positive impact, are the ones that stay run by the founders, but also the ones that create the greatest returns. So we want the founders to grow with their companies. But what does that mean if you think about a high growth company? It's going to grow like a thousand times or more in its in this hyper growth and within a few years. If the company, if your startup has to grow that much, if you want to be with it, you've got to grow that much too. So you're also a startup. And if you don't think about it that way, there are a few pitfalls that could happen. And some of them have happened to me, which I'd like, like to share. Um, and maybe share a few of the ways out of it as well. So there's three things I'd like to focus on that could, that could really go wrong. One is how it could really hurt you personally um, if you're not, you're not putting attention on, on your own growth um, as a person, how it could hurt your company, and how it could hurt the world. And the first one um, I experienced quite a bit during my time building in PayPal. And, um, we were very successful very quickly. Within a year and a half, we had a million users with a number one payment system on eBay. Um, I led the marketing program at that time. Um, we just merged with X.com. We, we created the number one payments network together with, with Elon Musk, X.com, and, and our company, PayPal. And um, in a very short amount of time, we were both successful in our, our mission and financially, and we were personally financially successful. And I remember the day I first made a million dollars. And I thought this was this is the thing I've been waiting for, which was so important to me that, that that was the main reason for building the company. And here I had it. It's like we put a million dollars. It's in my bank account, and, and and I suddenly start having these thoughts about comparing myself to other people and my friends. I mean, for uh, for you those of you who don't know, there were six founders at PayPal. Um, I, I, there was sort of numbered in a certain way, like an employee number and whatever, but um, I wasn't the first employee there. And so there's an equity difference and a, and a cash difference. It's something I've never done it before in this way. When I'm comparing myself to my friends and to, to like everybody, other employees, everybody else, this took my focus off of what were much more important things, like building the company and, and the things that gave me satisfaction. And what I thought was the greatest success in the, in the company um, Sorry, but I thought it was a great success for myself, 
what I thought I needed for myself, which was to have the financial independence and that, that level of success, it turned out to actually hurt me and make me more lost and make me potentially less productive. I do remember that that, that, that happened um, and uh, I ended up leaving the company early. I ended up feeling very unfulfilled um, at PayPal. I felt much more fulfilled when I was broke and when I just had the, the equity in the company. And you know, what turned around for me was a few, um, a few years later, uh, a friend of mine, who's also a Stanford student, my, my friend Steve Osqui, uh, he uh, I was visiting him in, in Austin, and he said, Luke, you're, you know what, you're a great investor. I mean, I, I wasn't doing that at that time. I was, I was just getting started, but um, we're still putting everything together. So you should, you should be an early stage investor. You have enough on your own to do that. You can just invest small amounts of money because you have the ability to see people that are just beginning to have an idea where other people can't see them. And that's your gift. And you need to do that with your life. And it took uh, me hearing that advice from someone outside of me and forgetting about the money for a while to start Founders Fund and to, to begin its work. And I know it sounds like very trite at that time, but for me at that, I, I didn't want to hear that. Actually, I actually didn't like VCs. I mean, they were kind of, the whole process starting with Founders Fund was how to make it kind of not like a VC in a lot of ways. So hearing that advice about you should really be an investor is not what I want to hear. And what I suggest to you in that is to, to seek out the advice of your friends who are telling you things that you don't want to hear. They might have the truth. They might actually be able to help you in that time when you have not been able to see for yourself what you need out of your own company. The second thing um, that could happen is that, this, that you could hurt your company if you don't grow quickly enough. And that happened in the kind of the middle part of building Founders Fund. We grew very quickly. We 10 x our capital in three years. And I thought venture capital was going to be slow and we we're going to be able to, to take our time investing and maybe even go on more vacations than I did back when. PayPal. When we were at PayPal, we canceled Christmas vacation once. I mean, it was like, we can't be on that vacation. The entire engineering team is, was from the University of Illinois, which is where I'm from, so we had to make this, like, we can't, we can't have Christmas. I mean, I thought I'd maybe I'd be able to have a couple of vacations a year. Well, it turned out that year we were growing, at that time, very, very quickly. And uh, what happened is Spanish from began to lose mission, because the thing that grew was the money, and not to say that money is an evil, we're, we're capitalists at, at Founders Fund, most of the team is libertarians. But in particular, we had to focus a little bit more on the management fees rather than the carry and the growth of the, the capital. And uh, during that time, um, Founders Fund was not as focused on its mission. And what I sought out is I sought out a, a, some, some executive coaching. And what I thought what I needed wasn't what was going to come out of this. What, what, got, what came out of it is I became, became resolutely focused on a mission, even more so than I ever was. And I found that it was something deeper than just helping founders. It was helping founders who were building companies in technologies that could transform human life for the better. And at that time, we began to make our, some more seminal investments together at, at Founders Fund. It became what you guys know today as the company that's funding transform technology like SpaceX, which is which I sit on the board of, for instance. And that there was, there was actually a difficulty there as well. So it's not that easy to find a coach or a mentor. If you want to find someone to help you, you've got to convince them to take the time away from the valuable things that they're doing. In this case, I, I found someone I liked. I, I had to convince them, look, we're going to be raising this fund. We're growing like crazy. I, need your, I, need, I don't want to just talk like once a month. I want you to be in the trenches with me, helping a bit for the next six months. I told him to cancel his seminars, which he was teaching, once a month. And I said, I will pay you whatever you lose off of your seminars. Like, we, we have enough to be able to afford that. Whatever you lose, I will pay you. And he said, you know, deal, I'll do this for a few months. And I said, suggest to you that if you have someone who, wants to, to, who you think is really going to help you grow, it's probably someone who's really busy and that have, has grown things that are big themselves. And you've got to enroll them in your success and get them to devote the time and invest themselves in your success. And then they'll be able to help you grow in that time when you really need it. And the third thing that could happen um, is the thing that could go wrong. If you don't grow as quickly as your startup guys, is you could actually hurt the world. And um, I'll provide I have many different examples of this, but I'll stick to the, the personal ones. When we began to invest in artificial intelligence companies, um, and I felt for the first time my level of what I could take responsibility for um, is now not just some of the company that can affect millions of lives, but perhaps the, the future of the whole human species. 
where if we create intelligence that's greater than our own, what does that mean for humanity? And it was a, just a question that I was not quite able to grapple with. Um, and around, we, we looked at like four, it was a, four AI companies at the same time, and investing in two of them, Vicarious and DeepMind Technologies. DeepMind was just recently sold to Google. Um, and what I did uh, was in 2010 is I went on a silent meditation retreat. And I don't know what the path is for you guys, and I don't necessarily recommend that, or whether it's silent or not, but I, I remember this one point where they, uh, uh, when I came in and they took my cell phone. And, and this, is, <laughs> this is not something I was really comfortable with. put it in a box, and uh, they took my cell phone and my laptop. There was going to be no interaction with the outside world, just the, the time for reflection. And by day four, um, I wanted that cell phone back. And I, I resolved I was going to go find it and break in to the office and get my cell phone. Um, and I did. And they, <laughs> and they had moved it. Um, so I got to be in science for 10 days. And, uh, and no interaction for 10 days. And what happened was at the end of it, I'm not saying I can handle everything perfectly, but um, I didn't feel... Uh, this kind of like weight of that was generated by myself. I didn't feel that I there was anything wrong with me. That there was anything that I wasn't enough. And here it was. Let's go make these great investments and help them. And let's have everyone at Foundation help as much as we can. And that was a very difficult, um, was a very difficult thing to do to be disconnected for for ten days and really nobody understood. I remember what even Elon said when he found out. You're going, you should, you're going, you're for ten days. Should you be working? <laughs> um, but I did it because of the projects we were working on, because I thought that I needed to go, if I'm going to be helping create a human mind, I should understand my own human mind first. And that's just one way you can do it, and there are many ways. And um, in some of the work that Peter and I are doing, we funded um, different work in understanding psychology and entrepreneurial development. And hopefully that will come to fruition in the future, and we'll be able to give you more specific advice. Right now, we just have stories and anecdotes. And I'm also really uh, glad that you are, are doing all the work you are right now at, at Stardex to help mentor and grow the next generation of, of entrepreneurs because we need it. We need to create um, the best companies that are going to, to, to help humanity move forward and we need to also be able to create ourselves in a way that we can grow and move forward as the technology moves forward so quickly. So thank you very much everybody. And I've got a little bit of uh, time for questions at, at the end of it, so you can hold the applause a little bit. How much time is there? All right, who has questions? <coughs> questions? Some regrets, even though it's allowed the creation of, of so many different things today, like 
uh, founders fund and palantir technologies and space this all came out of ex paypal people but I, I i do have some regrets about it i do see many things that were lost because we sold and we sold um you know we say that we sold for business reasons for strategy reasons but i think we sold for psychology reasons because we didn't understand how to grow and survive under that kind of stress for several years. Hi, um, as a researcher um, who's been working with um, biotech software, and how do you recommend that you go commercialize that software? Um, wouldn't know how to do it unless it's the, it has to be a conversation about the specific software, and I don't know if there's enough time for that in this. Yeah, it's a bit of a complicated question. Yeah. This is one up here. You want to get it? Hi. Um, I, was, I found your idea about growing itself as well as your company really compelling. And I just wanted to know a bit more about your experience um, growing yourself and, and how you've done that in the context of your own life. The question is, um, she wants to know about how Luke, uh, what Luke's experience with growing himself was like. So. One thing is just that the, I can't advise you anything other than to do it right now. And that is because the specific prescriptions matter so much for your individual phase of development and for who you are. So I can't tell you, oh, it's like this particular executive coach or like this particular meditation retreat or like go see this psychologist or like put this person on your board. They know everything about like your team development. Um, but. It's just, what I can say is that it is very important that you do it. It's utterly important that, that you do it for the three reasons that I outlined. And hopefully in the future, we're going to have more things to say about it as we work a little more systematically with it at, at, at Founders Fund. So something that you, uh, you talked about was that it's actually really hard. It's, from a psychological perspective, it's really hard to build a company. Um, so. Why should people do that when they can, you know, go into finance and make a lot of money, or um, you know, do consulting or uh, other things like that that are seemingly easier and less uncertain? You know, for um, for me, it's something I couldn't not do it. I just couldn't not do it. And I would say, you know, you're an entrepreneur if you can't not do this thing that's stupidly hard. And then you keep doing, maybe even you fail the first time around, or it's not that big uh, and not that successful the first time around. So there's a way that, for me, um, I needed, I knew that I was capable of more, and this fits in with the other side of, of, of your, yourself. If you feel like you need to grow more than you will at the, the consulting or the, the, the eye banking job, the only way you can do that is by creating your own environment to do that with your own team, finding your own way. And so what a startup can offer. And I want to say the second part, because I don't want to make it narcissistic, that the, the, the greater motivation in your, in your company should be what is it doing for the world, and not just what it is, is doing for yourself. And that is the other part that, that comes in when you can't, can't help but not do it. Elon couldn't help but not start SpaceX because the world needed, in his view, to be living among the stars. And nobody else wasn't doing it. And he described the day that he looked on the NASA website and it said, well, we're not going to Mars. Oh, shit, I thought that was next. And it says, so what, OK, I guess we're we going to go back to the moon or somewhere? No, actually, there were no plans to go anywhere. And he felt that humanity needed it. And he felt his engineering capabilities, money could do it, so he did it. And, and at Founders Fund, uh, what motivated me was that I looked around and nobody was doing venture capital in a way at that time. I think it's changed and grown a lot at that, ta that time, which put the founders first. And what, what, what became for me is like a, almost a negative thing about venture capital. I felt, we've got to build this. We've got to do this. Because if, if we're not doing it, no one else is doing it. All right. All right. Let's give Luke a round of applause. Thank you again, Luke. We know that you uh, just came up from Santa Cruz and are on your way back, so we're glad we could get some time with you today. So, 
Up next, we're going to have several of our companies come up, talk about what they've built, and maybe have some asks for this group as well. Up first is one of our head tech companies, Gita with Nearpod. Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. A few first timers for me, sharing the stage with the founders of PayPal and Yahoo. Just incredible. And the second one, I'm always the late in the event, so I'm going to throw one up there. I never get the t-shirt. So. Oh, no. oh, well, you got it. That's exactly why I never get it. Yeah. Anyway, so my name is Guido. Uh, I'm a recent education fellow at the D School. Uh, I'm also the founder of Nearpod, and we've been using design thinking in the last two years to build the operating system for the K-12 classroom. My team and I have worked on several su successful companies together, and we've worked with some of the premium brands in education. Today, I want to talk about how the rise of mobile is completely reshaping K-12 education, both inside the classroom and out. A few reasons for that. First of all, how many of you were in high school in the last five years? Raise your hands. Keep your hands up if you had fun during class in high school. Oh, a few. So that's exactly the problem we're trying to tackle. Once people have mobile devices in, the, in their hands, it's becoming really, really hard for teachers to engage students in class. So we're pretty much trying to help teachers bring engagement up by using mobile devices. So we're making mobile devices to become allies and not enemies for teachers during live instruction. The second thing that is, oops. Well, the second thing that is fundamentally radically different today is mobile distribution is changing. It's a game changer for companies in this space. It used to be impossible unless you had a huge sales team to get inside the classroom. Now, teachers have access to the app stores, and through that, they download whatever they want. And I'm having some issues with the presentation. Yeah, so anyway. So we've all seen the consumerization of the enterprise. Um, I'm a witness of how a very similar trend is happening in K-12 education. Now, teachers have a voice. And I know what you're thinking. Teachers have no money. They might have a voice, they have no money. Actually, if you do a quick math, there are four million teachers in the US. All of them will tell you that they spend money from their own pockets, all of them. And if you've been a K-12 teacher, you know that you do, and you rarely get reimbursed. So the numbers are actually 3.2 billion. That's already an interesting market to tackle. Even more importantly, today, teachers are a big influence in how teacher schools and districts are spending their money. Again, game changing. They didn't matter to influence these big buckets or big spendings that were uh, in the hands of the districts and schools. Now they do. And if you know teachers, you know that they're a very close community. They influence each other. They kind of have all these network effects that we as entrepreneurs like to see. And that kind of communal behavior of teachers is exactly why we're convinced that there's going to be one dominant winning platform for the classroom. And we're fighting versus the big guys. They're all trying to be the dominant winning platform for the classroom. So why Nearpod? First of all, we help teachers at the point of instruction. We're not a social network. We're not a communication with parents. We're there when they need it, which is what they value the most, when they're teaching kids. How we do that? Well, we pick whatever content they had, usually PowerPoint, PDF, whatever they had created, and with a drag and drop, we let them create what it feels to them like a mobile app. They just add a few interactive features, we call them widgets, and with that they truly engage their students in class. So this is created by a teacher. They just upload kind of a cell image and, and kids are drawing on top of it. No developer, no programming, no person, nobody involved, just a teacher that picked an image, put it up in their nearby presentation, and kids can interact with that image in class. Not only that, but then they assess students in real time using this platform. Teachers love it. I mean, we've been here for two years, mostly bootstrapped. We have half a million teachers. And the most incredible thing, they're helping us upsell to their schools and districts. We have no boots on the ground. 
we don't fly, we don't visit districts, we close over a thousand contracts already, all inbounds from schools and districts. We're, we're at a revenue rate of two million dollars. So hopefully you guys were referring to Nearpod when we, you said we were at the top of the revenues in StartX and we raised only 750. So it's pretty much a good track company that it's already profitable in a very hard market. VCs hate K-12 education. They hate it. I've seen it. You know what, K-12 K education. I'm going to give you a meeting just because you're friends with a friend with a friend, but I don't care about what you're doing. I don't like it. We've already burned our hands investing in that space. Well, we're making money already. Not only that, but we're building a community of teachers that are sharing content with each other. So the more teachers that join the platform, the more content that gets uploaded and shared. We're a lot more than just a software. We're a growing community of teachers that are sharing content with each other. They're pretty much bypassing whatever the district is throwing at them. We're so proud. Most of this content, with all that nice design, is done by teachers, and it gets paid every single day through PayPal, thank you, uh, and that money comes directly to us, 3% commissions. No Pearson, no district, no nothing. So we absolutely love this trend. We're kind of a quirky for K-12 education. And they love it so much that in the first year, year of renewals, which is the only history that we have, we had almost zero churn, zero. All the contracts, and these are pretty much small contracts, you did the math, all of them renew. So what do we have? We have a product that has market fit. We have a go-to-market strategy that, which is very innovative. No one goes from the bottoms up and up in this industry. So we're kind of surprising the industry. Now it's about reaching scale. We're about to close a Series A, kind of a strong one hopefully, and we're intending to hire as much for interns and students as possible. So if you're interested, go open an account in Neopod and then reach out to me once you learn the platform. We're the airport and we're the future of mobile education. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to introduce my friend Varun, who's working on a very meaningful problem for kids too. So Varun, come on stage.
Once we do that, we're also able to push the sleep data out to sleep coaches. So if parents want additional help putting that kid to bed, we're able to help them with that as well. And ultimately, build systems that connect with the smart home. On the back of this system, we're able to passively collect sleep data to build the first and largest database around children's sleep and family habits around sleep. So we uh, have a couple of opportunities that are open. We're looking to hire an electrical engineer, someone with embedded systems experience, and ideally someone with sleep monitoring experience as well. And we have a number of, uh, number of internships open in marketing, product development, clinical studies. And so if any of this sounds exciting or you just want to learn a little bit more about how we can make your lives a little better, come find Andy or me at our booth outside. So in a nutshell, Cadian solves anxiety and sleep problems for 90 million parents in the U.S. Thank you. So that's sort of all my green in a nutshell. 
and we're trying to grow very rapidly, so we're looking for amazing people to join our team. So we're looking for an electrical engineering intern, also hopefully you have embedded systems experience. So if you're that, please come to me, uh, talk to me at the booth outside, and of course have some healthy food at the same time. Um, also we're looking for a COO and a CTO slash head of engineering. And additionally, if you are a logistics expert, come talk to me, I'd love to pick your brain. And if you have friends working in companies above 50 plus employees, I'd also love to talk to you for potential intro. So that's it, that's the Omar Green story. Thank you for listening. And now we will have Steve from Badger Maps talk to you about the sales productivity platform. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here today. Um, I'm actually a Stanford alum. I was GSP class of 06 before we had this glorious room that we're in today, right? We're in the ghetto about three blocks away there. But um, it's good to see you. Good, good, good to be back. Um, look, so basically, I, I left Stanford, went to Google, and uh, I was on the maps team there. And I, I, and I was a, on the sales side of Google. And I left Google to uh, to start this company, it's a mapping tool for outside salespeople. So we have a platform that helps outside salespeople do their job more effectively. Um, I teamed up with the best guy that, uh, that I knew in mapping when I was at Google, and uh, we spent the last two years and built out this tool, and so it's, uh, it's been pretty successful in the market now, and we're, we're really happy with it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it today. Um, what we do, basically, is we take uh, these mobile phones that everyone has in their, uh, in their pockets right now. They're super useful for things like Snapchatting selfies to your friends and that sort of thing. But they're also, they're also really, uh, that wasn't funny, I thought that was the start. <laughs> um, so uh, they're also really useful, they, they can be really useful business tools. And so what we've done is we've built, a, we've taken the, the, this device and made a tool for outside salespeople. What it basically does is it, it links in with their, their company's data and services that on the phone, integrates with their calendar, integrates with outside data sources such as Inside View, which is a data company, Google Places, thing, and uh, I mean, let, lay all that over a Google Map, which is super useful for, for people that are outside salespeople in the field. Here's what they can do with it. They, uh, they can organize their day, they can um, make, plan their schedule out, they can filter and do some business intelligence work on their customer set. And, and basically, they, uh, outside sales jobs, and I don't know how, how much you guys know about this, uh, this career path, but basically you go out and meet with between five and 10 people a day and try to sell them stuff. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, a great career path, there's a lot of busy work in it, and we do a lot of that busy work for them. So a little bit about the business. Um, we, we've got some nice traction so far. We did, we've done about 450K in booking so far this year. One of those is with, uh, with a uh, Fortune 500 company, a six-figure deal. So they, they, they're using it now successfully in the field, and it's, uh, so we're pretty happy with that. We've got a pretty thick pipeline right now, and uh, our, our velocity is, is increasing, which is, uh, which, is, which is why we're here, honestly. We're doing about 80 signups per week today, and that's up from about 20 in January. So a lot more, a lot more activity going through our, our world here. We're pretty uniquely positioned as, as a company. What we do is that there's a lot of sales productivity stuff, and there's a lot of mapping stuff out there, and we're we're unifying these two two ideas, which is what an outside salesperson needs. Here's a little bit about the team. Um, I told you a bit about my background. Gutty is the technical co-founder, he's an amazing mapping sales engineer, and uh, Jimmy is an awesome UI UX guy, Eric was in SNE out of here a couple years ago, and he's been on the team ever since, some great advisors, advisors and I'm, I'm really happy with what the team's been able to accomplish in a really pretty short period of time. We are, uh, we're, we're raising money right now, and also we're hiring, and we've got internship opportunities in, uh, in PR, and marketing, and sales, all, all three of those. So it'd be great to, uh, to chat with anyone who's passionate about this space and wants to learn more. Uh, I'll be out at the, at the uh, tables out there. Next up for you, we've got, uh, we've got Ben with DataFox, another, uh, another company that's named after an animal, which is, uh, which is a lot of fun. Hey, thanks guys. It's, uh, <laughs> it's been Uh, 
huge thanks to Cameron, uh, Cameron and the Starac staff uh, for inviting us. They've been so supportive to us, and we just benefited so much from going through the, the accelerator and being surrounded by so many like just killer founders who are so focused on their team and really helpful to us, especially when it came down to fundraising. So, Data Fox, uh, we help you understand and predict trends in the private tax sector. So our team is four Stanford grads. Uh, we have a mix of finance and CS backgrounds. Uh, we're with places like Fox, Cisco, Goldman Sachs. We're backed by Starks and the Stanford Fund and Google Ventures, a couple others. So where did Data Fox come from? In a past life, we spent our time tracking private companies using the tools of the trade. So we used Google and spreadsheets. What this meant is you read news articles, you try to remember everything, you stick it in a spreadsheet, you email that spreadsheet to your boss, your colleagues, you get an update, you update your spreadsheet, you email it to your boss, your colleagues, and this just kept going on and on. Super painful, really tedious. So here's our solution. Data Fox is the automated analyst. So let's say you're a Stanford student, you want to work in an awesome startup, it's really going to go places, not necessarily easy to find. So what Data Fox likes you to do is you go into our search tool, you type in some parameters, like I want a company in Palo Alto or nearby, pre-series A, series A maybe, uh, maybe I want to focus this even more, I'm interested in like health space, you can use some of those keywords, and we generate this sort of magic spreadsheet for you. All the data on these companies, it's always up to date. And then you can really dive into this, pick some things that look interesting, and then we let you really dive into the data. So it's trivial to do things like graph company score versus how old is a company. So the companies at the top of this list, in the upper left, those are really young companies with awesome scores. Like those are the high flyers you want to go check out. But we can go a step further than this. Now that you're starting to show a list of companies, we help you track these companies. And what Datafox is doing automatically is tracking all the major events in all these companies. So rather than reading the news yourself, we can extract things that say, these are the companies that had fundraising events, these are the companies that hire a key executive. And whether you're an investor or a, a job seeker, if you find out that a company just hired a CFO with you know, IPO experience, that's just golden data. That's a company that thinks they're going to go public, like you should really check them out. Moreover, like, if you've ever just had somebody like, hey, have you heard of this company before? You can go into our database of 400,000 companies and just quickly see things like who works there, what's their background, what do they do, who do they compete against, what are the major best milestones they've reached. So, how do we do all of this? Rather than the old manual process, we rely a lot on NLP, that's natural language processing, a lot of machine learning, to take unstructured data and turn it into structured data. So we're collecting data from APIs, crawling blogs, uh, web pages, news articles, extracting all the data out of that, structuring it, cleaning it, combining it, and then we run some advanced algorithms to really you know, deliver some insights. So to give you an example, I used to work at Box. Box has a bunch of keywords they use to describe themselves, like cloud, file syncing, we can take those keywords and dynamically put them into a category called collaborative software, which we dynamically generated rather than using like the old school SXC codes that aren't very useful. And then we can go another step and actually tell you boxes similar to these other companies. So you have like box similar to Dropbox on the one hand, or maybe similar to Huddle, which is more of an enterprise product. And we can use those relationships to give you more information. And then we can layer on all this work we've done to extract events. So now we can deliver super interesting, super insightful uh, alerts to you. Then not only say something like, okay, you're interested in Box, their CEO Aaron Levy was just you know, mentioned in this news article. We can tell you one of their competitors just launched a product. Or maybe it's the opposite. One of their competitors just had layoffs. Like, this is probably a really good sign for Box. They're really beating out the competition. So it's just one of the examples of the many algorithms we use. We do scoring on companies, we uh, dynamically calculate the momentum. I'd love to go on and on and talk about this. Uh, we're hiring. So if you like data science, you want to find out more about data science at DataFox, come visit our room. Thank you.
with that piece of art. She also has a 25% referral coupon. So Beth, since she doesn't have the app, clicks on the link and goes to the app store. And then this is where everything breaks. Since the app stores don't allow you to pass data through install, when she opens up the first time, she gets the same generic welcome experience as every other user. She loses the referral code, and she doesn't see the piece of art that her friend intended her to see. Now here she has two options. She can go back into the text message, copy and paste the referral code into the app, and then search for the piece of art. Or the more likely scenario, she closes the app and never uses it again. We've all experienced this at some point in another. But it's not just a problem for consumers. It's also a problem for developers. Take Ethan. This is his app, and he's built a great referral program. The problem is he can't pass data through install. So, with the referrals, he loses the referral code, but he also can't track where installs are coming from. Because of this, he has no idea where his users are coming from and can't optimize his marketing campaigns appropriately. So, with the branch SDK, we've solved this. We're a deep linking solution that helps pass data through install. So, what does that mean? That basically means, as a developer, you can create links that are automatically generated in the app when somebody shares, when somebody invites, or even if you just want to send a marketing email. And in that link, you can embed any data you want, whether that's a referral code, whether that's a name, or a specific spot in the app they want somebody to go to after they download. So let's look at a more detailed example. So Mata's in an app, and she wants to share. So she hits share, and at that moment, we generate a URL on the fly. And in that URL is Mata's name, her picture, the referral code, and the piece of art that she wanted to share. She can put this in a text message, she can email this, she can post on Facebook or Twitter, and then whoever clicks on that link, let's say it's me, when they open up the app for the first time after installing it, they get a personal welcome message from Mono. It also shows the art piece that she wanted them to see, and automatically passes through the referral code, so I'm already credited that 25% off. This is an install experience that has never before been possible, but it is with the branch SDK. So we're a team of four Stanford founders. Three of us just graduated in June from the GSB here. We've been working on this for only four months, and in that time, we've doubled the team, have about 50 awesome partners with another 100 in the pipeline. And we've raised three million recently from MEA. So how can you help? Two apps. If you're a developer or you have a company with a mobile app, come talk to us afterwards. We have a booth. We'd love to talk to you to help with your viral growth or any sort of install attribution. If you're looking for a job, we're looking for developer evangelists, software engineers, and actually a biz dev person as well. On Branch Metrics. Right. Thanks.
So, yeah, we search at the beginning of this year and uh, already have a lot of boards out. It's really transforming the way that people are getting around the city. Uh, people are having a lot of fun on it. Um, and I'm not sure what happened to the slides here. <laughs> Um, so we're looking for we're looking to hire right now, uh, mostly like in sales and marketing, and um, also looking for developers and designers uh, to help get this product out. And um, our uh, we're not staying here with just uh, skateboards. We're really looking at putting um, our power chain onto other types of products also, and really transforming uh, the way people are getting around the cities. Um, we also have a small batch. We finally have gone through like a lot of pre-orders. So uh, if you're interested in buying a board, we have uh, boards ready to ship. And we have a promo code here, which will give you uh, free shipping. Um, and finally, I'd also like to thank uh, StartX. When we uh, did StartX uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, being a hardware company, um, you know, it's, it was difficult finding really good mentorship, and StartX really helped us find some good hardware mentors, so definitely very thankful for StartX. Uh, and finally, if you guys want to try out the board, we're going to be at the booth outside, so come on out and give it a try. Thanks. I have a, I have a boosted board, and I brought it in uh, to work. I actually wrote it uh, entirely like the beta breakers, for those of you who know that. It's pretty awesome. Uh, all right, so um, up next we have an awesome speaker, Jerry Yang. Uh, but right before then, I want to get everyone to stand up, shake out, and we're going to throw out some t-shirts. All right, shake out, up, oh, yeah. Get it, here, come up and down. While he was at Stanford, he co-founded Yahoo. It's pretty awesome. He's now on the Stanford Board of Trustees and is an, is an, invest, an, an investor. Uh, investing is capital with Ame Ventures, which is an excellent firm. We work with them a lot. Um, so we're really pleased to have Jerry out here today. So let's all give him a warm round of applause. I don't think Cameron has to worry about being a baseball player anytime soon with that arm. Yeah. Um, everybody hear me okay? Yeah? How many students are here? I, I just, I'm trying to figure out this audience. Okay, okay that's not bad. There, there's some of you that probably got more gray hair than me, so I'm not quite sure uh, what you guys are. But uh, I'm glad to see uh, uh, the only thing bad about the StarX demo day is right in the middle of the football game. Yeah, Stanford is up 10 6, so uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, I, uh, um, you know, every time I step on campus, I feel like I'm a student again. Um, I'm reminded my 21st, uh, 25th uh, reunion is coming up next year, so um, it's been quite a few years since I've been gone, but obviously I have very close affinity and affection to Stanford. I was an um, undergrad here, um, got my master's as well, double E, and then um, while I was doing my PhD, um, uh, David Fio and I were uh, trying everything we possibly can not to do our thesis. We were um, <laughs> playing a lot of softball, we were playing intramural basketball, we were playing fantasy, God knows what. Um, and that's when the internet was um, uh, becoming, um, uh, the web was coming, and, um, and the web protocol was becoming a way of unifying all these other different protocols on the internet. And we thought, wow, it'd be pretty cool to just have a list of all the interesting things that's going on on the web all the time. And that um, little hobby turned out to be um, Yahoo, which uh, actually for a while it was never intended to be our startup, but we were actually sitting around and trying to come up with other ideas um, uh, to, to, to actually go and start a company around, but in, in the meantime we were just kind of keeping this Yahoo thing as a hobby. And um, 
uh, one day we, we came back, I don't know what we were, but we came back and all of a sudden, like all the VCs started calling and they said, you know, what, if you guys, what are you guys doing with it? You guys are, you know, um, and, and at this time our, for um, Stanford uh, Computer Science and WE department were saying, you guys got to move off campus, you're taking up way too much network and, you know, there's all this traffic coming through this little corner, we can't hide you anymore. Um, <laughs> We talked to uh, Dean Hennessy at the time. He was fantastic. I mean, the entire Stanford experience obviously was just a dream come true for me. Um, I never did get my PhD, um, but uh, uh, my mom wasn't very happy being an Asian mom, but uh, <laughs> she's not complaining anymore, though. Um, <laughs> but I thought I'd, I'd give you guys a little bit of um, just the early young stuff, and then I want to talk about what I'm doing now. and. Um, um, but when we first started Yahoo, um, it was uh, almost 20 years ago. In, in fact, it was 1994 in the fall when we um, started putting the, the services together. And um, boy, do I wish <laughs> Stardust was around back then. Uh, it, was, was, it was just a little bit harder, right? You have to go figure out everything. You can't just do everything on a laptop. You don't have AWS. You don't have all these things. That really just makes it really easy um, to start a business. But those are sort of the physical part. Um, um, and I think it really came down also to sort of the intellectual part that is very hard to get at the time. Even though Stanford was sort of a um, nexus and a centerpiece for entrepreneurs, I remember um, even as, as grad students we would come to the then business school and take classes or sitting on classes and all these great entrepreneurs who already built stuff in the 80s and 90s would come back and talk to students. But it was never really formalized in a way that allowed the kind of networking in the community to develop. So we had to go figure out our own mentors. We had to go figure out, um, you know, who, who, which VCs are better, um, how to raise money, how not to raise money, um, and um, and. But you know what you find, and what I found, and what David and I found, even in the early days, was there is always there's just tremendous support around Stanford and around the Valley for entrepreneurs. People, people, you know, you're like. People are like egging you on to want to do great stuff because they can see it. And, and now that I'm in the investing business and, and I primarily invest in entrepreneurs as well, um, you can see we can see somebody with a dream and doing great, and you want to just help them. And that spirit, I think, is really endemic here at Stanford. And I think, um, in many ways, Stardex is really trying to capitalize on that community, that mentorship, that coaching, um, sort of that invisible layer, which I think, um, especially as you're growing the company, becomes really, really, really important. We um, started with two of us, and um, uh, you know, kind of everything at Stanford kind of comes back to roost. Um, uh, my our third employee was my freshman uh, dorm mate from Stanford, uh, Tim Brady, who's now running Magic K12, um, and uh, um, he was a um, the business school, Stanford of the East, um, at the time, and um, he actually left the quarter early. He did get his degree, but he left the quarter early to come help write our business plan. Um, and so, you know, it was it was this really interesting time where you relied on people you already knew from before. It's really hard to go and um, find new people all the time to kind of do stuff that you really, you know, you really need and depend and trust somebody to do. Um, but over time, you know, as the company scales and the product scales, you need to find people. And the, and the paradox is always, you know, you want to you want to hold on to that small little startup as long as you can because, um, uh, you know, you're, you're working hard, you're in this rhythm, things are going great. Um, but then, you know, you have to grow it. You have to expand the team. It's pretty pretty soon, you go from two to five. You know, it's like cell division. You pretty much you have to start a growing the company. And um, and I'm just, I I think that's one of the hardest pieces of growing companies, especially even now for a lot of entrepreneurs, going from the, the 20 to 30 people to, to the 100 people. You really go through this um, massive different scale. You start to not know everybody's name anymore. You start to have badges. You have to hire lawyers and accountants. You know? and, um, and these are things that you, you have to um, get used to because you're planning to build a great company. You plan for success. Um, but it is uh, tricky and sometimes um, because you're not going to be able to have that high bar of quality or high bar of knowing everybody. Um, and, and I think for us, for David and I, that was sort of a very interesting time. It was um, 
uh, probably more than any other phase of Yahoo's um, you know, start, starting days. That was sort of a uh, coming of age. Um, you know, Yahoo started in a, in a trailer not too far from here, and, um, and I would say that the, um, being in the Valley was a great um, stroke of luck, really, um, and being able to be at Stanford at the time was a stroke of luck. Um, but I think once, you know, we recognize that we have something that's really interesting, um, having the entire ecosystem here, having Sequoia Capital being our investor, um, and, then, and then being able to really uh, grow and, and, and go public very quickly. I mean, these days, you know, um, we're like a small story compared to where we are now. Um, but, but throughout growing at Yahoo, growing the, the business, um, having really strong people around us was sort of the mandate, right? We had a, a no, uh, I think Philo called it the no bozo rule, which is, you know, everybody else, you know, the two founders are the dumbest people in the company. Everybody else had to be smarter than us. And, um, and that was kind of a fun way to just sort of make sure that we always had people who knew something or could do something way better than we can. And that allowed us to have kind of a, an accretive, um, incrementally positive group to, to uh, continue to grow. And culture was extremely important. Uh, we wanted to have fun, we wanted to be somewhat irreverent, uh, but we, had, we wanted to have a culture of excellence and being able to really um, emphasize the team. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that I think, ever since we started at Yahoo, I mean, there's been two or three or four generations of different startups, and that's been massively successful. And I think every generation, um, we're seeing just even more interesting and more uh, innovative ways of defining culture. Uh, but I still think that cultural definition is what gets you through good times and what gets you through bad times. Um, what else can I talk about? Um, I, I think, you know, being, being um, I'm an immigrant, I came from Taiwan when I was 10, um, I was pretty much, I mean, I'm very much raised in San Jose, so I'm, I'm very much American, but I think when the internet really hit the late 90s, um, there was a fascination about what would happen with the internet in Asia, and um, it, in our big investor at the time was uh, SoftBank, and Masayoshi san said, you, you gotta, if we invest in you, you gotta come and start Yahoo Japan. And we started Yahoo Japan probably five years earlier than I would have started Japan at all. Um, and being in Japan, you realize um, uh, even that market, internet was gonna be huge, and Yahoo Japan to this day is still very successful. Um, and of course, after Japan, you, 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 you look at China. And I think um, uh, just having seen China's internet growth, um, we were very fortunate to uh, having met Jack Ma and Alibaba in 2005, and um, obviously he's all over the news now, but, um, but having, having seen sort of the Chinese internet market take off the last 10 years um, really gives you a different sense of entrepreneurship. And um, uh, it's, uh, um, it's one of those things where um, in order to compete effectively and in some ways survive in a very competitive environment, um, there are just a tremendous amount of tools that people have to use. And, um, some of them not all technical. We're, we're all very technical here in terms of, oh, you've got to have really hard tech, or you have to have IP. Um, but there's you know, zillions of tactics that, for example, Alibaba used in the early days in terms of really going out and create a groundswell of support from SMBs. And to this day, the SMBs are really their, um, their core constituency that's creating this amazing company. Um, and uh, marketing tactics or, um, or working with merchants or working with uh, customers. And, and a lot of it isn't high tech. And I think people forget that, you know, um, just getting your hands dirty and sometimes going out and, um, and, and uh, uh, not rely everything on technology sometimes works. And especially in China, I think you have an advantage with people and, and labor and, and things like that. Um, what am I doing in terms of thinking about China now? I, I think we are seeing, you know, sort of the, the big internet companies now are, are global, trying to be global companies. Um, but I also see a lot of um, ideas that are working in China, um, especially around e-commerce as an example, or messaging as an example, um, that is starting to um, get out of China into the Western world. So um, we've been looking at interesting ways in which commerce that has worked really well in China work over here. 
Um, we're looking at how messaging companies, WeChat being the most interesting, but there's obviously great messaging companies here and, and in Korea and Japan. Um, how some of those trends might come over to the US. Um, I'm investing at Ame Cloud Ventures, which is uh, my own investment firm. Um, and we invest in entrepreneurs. Uh, that's one of the things I really missed at Yahoo is being able to work with very early stage entrepreneurs. And, um, and, and I've been doing this since about 2012, and I would say that since 2012, um, the environment for innovation and for disruption is probably the most um, interesting, uh, and probably the most exciting time, because you know we've been, as you know, certainly at Yahoo, we've been waiting for mobile to come to the mainstream. We've been waiting for the cloud to come to the mainstream. We've been waiting for trends like the big data, and you know, hardware companies are hot again. Um, hardware and software services. Um, we're seeing uh, open source really creating a disruptive force in every level of software, uh, the great equalizer. Um, so if you just line up these mega trends, and I don't, you guys know these trends better than I do, um, bio and, and life sciences, we're, we're starting, we're investing more and more in um, life science and technology companies, software companies combined with robotics. Um, just incredible, incredible innovation. You know, I go through a meeting a week or a meeting every two weeks, you just go, oh my God, this guy's gonna, or this woman is gonna change the world. Um, and, and so, it's really fun. And I hope one of you guys, maybe many of you guys in this room, uh, will be that next great change the world kind of company. Um, and I would say that, you know, try to build companies. Don't build features. Don't build something that you think you can go down the street and sell to one of the big guys. Um, that's okay. I think that's fine. But I think a lot of people now think that's success. That's entrepreneurship. I sold a company to X. Um, but I hope people still think about this as building a sustainable, independent company that can be generating tremendous profits, generating tremendous revenue over a long period of time. Those are companies. Um, uh, now, there's a long way between that and the beginning, but, um, but I think that if you have an idea of creating a great company, um, the chances are you have multiple options. Um, if it doesn't quite get there. Uh, but if you're out to create a feature, um, you just hope somebody else doesn't create that feature first. So, um, before I ramble on, I'm getting the wave sign. Cameron, you wanna, you wanna do a little Q&A? Yeah, let's do, just, uh, let's do a little Q&A. So, um, you, um, uh, you, know, you knew Jack Ma early on, and Alibaba obviously had one of the, the largest, uh, well, largest Chinese IPO in history. Um, um, and you're now investing a lot of entrepreneurs. So a uh, question I get a lot is, uh, for guys like you who have seen the cycles of the valley, what are characteristics you're looking for in people or um, that you invest in? I, um, I know Jack probably, I think he does go out and talk about, you know, he tried to get money from VCs in the valley in the early 2000s and nobody would fund him. Um, and whether that's really true or not, who knows, he's a great urban legend now. But, um, <laughs> But I think that, um, I think if you, you know, um, I actually met Jack in the late 90s, and uh, he wasn't an entrepreneur, that he was actually working in the government at the time. Um, but even then, you just knew this guy was going to be something. He had a level of determination, a level of charisma, a level of um, inquisitiveness about everything. He was obviously very excited to meet, you know, me and, and trying to understand what, what the internet was all about. And, um, and you just knew he was going to go do something. So when I heard uh, later on that he started a company and he started uh, Alibaba and Taobao, um, it, it, was, uh, it was clear that this guy had spent a long time, years, figuring out how to really want to do what he wanted to do. And, um, and he wasn't going to stop. You know, it was, was one of those sort of guys you just realized he was going to figure it out no matter how and no matter what. So, I would say that, that, that quality of entrepreneurs is unique, um, even though we can all have networks and we have communities, but I still think the top entrepreneurs, um, um, you know, it, 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 you, can, you can recognize them from a mile away, and I think Jack was certainly one of those. Uh, so a follow-up question to that is, um, a lot of people come to us and they say, look, I have a great idea, or I'm a technologist and I need a co-founder. Um, you were successful, right? You were successful finding a co-founder um, as well at Stanford. 
Um, and uh, so what should people be looking for in other co-founders while they're here? And how should they utilize the resources at Stanford or their time at Stanford to find that right person? Um, co-founders are, are, are extremely important relationship. I mean, I, I would say David and I, um, outside our wives, I mean, it's like being married to it really is being like married to a co-founder. I mean, David and I, I think we, um, we fought like cats and dogs every, you know, all the time. We probably couldn't agree on anything. Um, but, um, but I would say it's, it's like a, um, it's somewhere between like a married couple and a sibling relationship where, you know, you, you love and you hate and you love and you ultimately respect and um, uh, really, really trust each other. And that word trust is, um, uh, you know, used a lot, but probably really the most important trait I would say you can, you can find in your co-founder. Um, uh, because I think that um, at some point, um, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, both, you, whether the company or yourselves are gonna hit a crossroad and, and you're gonna have doubt, you're gonna have uncertainty, you're gonna have fear, and, um, and whether those, those emotions can be uh, controlled by yourself or you, sometimes you just have to sit down and talk to somebody about it. And, and, um, and, and certainly when, when David and I have our conversations about, you know, um, uh, especially at Crossroads, um, you know, we throw all our little arguments aside and really, I think, do come together and be able to make um, each other feel better or make decisions or decide to move forward knowing that, you know, we've talked it through. So, um, so that trust element is really hard and, and you almost can't just assume that trust. You have to really create it, earn it, and um, be able to, to really build on it. And that's probably the thing that I would focus on. Um, you know, we had a very uh, fortunate incubation period at Stanford, right? I mean, we didn't have startups, but we had um, our graduate school experience. And so, having worked on projects together, Dave and I were in Kyoto, in the, the Stanford campus in Japan together. Um, and, and having those sort of experience, life experiences outside of starting a company, um, you know, made us great friends and, um, you know, uh, prepared us for, for the journey. So, um, so being able to find people that are, um, Interesting to you now, you have no idea. They may become your co-founder someday, but, um, but, but, but being able to have a, a network of people that you can trust and count on down the line while you're a student or while you're um, near the university, I think that's probably a great way to do it. So we see a lot of students come in and uh, some like spend a lot of time just kind of focusing on classes. Some do a lot of extracurriculars and party. Um, the grad students are in lab all the time. So. Um, what I've, what I've heard for you in the past is that uh, building kind of building the tr uh, a, a trusted relationship and a network of people that you trust is really important. So um, how, um, why is it important? And um, how has it helped you over the course of your career? Or has it? It, it, it has, and, and I, I, you know, I, um, when David and I were, we, we also believe in giving back, and I think when David and I gave back to the university, our, our first professorship, um, this was during President Gerhard Casper's uh, days at Stanford, and we went up to Hoover House, and they gave us a, a nice dinner to, to, to help do the chair, uh, the, the file and Jerry Yang chair. Um, and I got up there, and I said to Gerhard Casper, I said, President Casper, you probably don't remember, I was a, uh, I think I was an ASSU senator, or I, I don't know what I was, I was one of the student government guys here, and when he first came and um, talked to the students, I was, uh, um, this is probably being recorded, right? But I said, I said to President Casper, well, you know, I mean, this, all these classes and all this stuff is useless. Um, you know, we, we, we basically get to know people, we party, we have great, you know, times, and this is, that's what this university experience is all about, right? Um, and of course, you know, um, I, I was probably just being, you know, young and naive and, and sort of making a point, but, um, but, but, but having that network, um, Yes, I, I, I obviously studied, I developed the skill, I got my degrees, but I think that um, being able to develop a network of people that you can uh, go to, um, uh, mentors, teachers, professors, I mean, the professors here are great. They, they, they want to be your friend, ultimately. And um, uh, so many of them, professors that, um, that were my professors, um, have helped me over the years. And so, uh, so it's not just other students. Um, um, but it's really other uh, parts of the university. Some administrators are great people. Uh, so it's just a, a, a great time to kind of build that network. Um, 
the studying is important, just for the record, but I do think that um, uh, you're at Stanford, you should take advantage of all the resources that are here. Um, there's, um, well, actually, before I ask another question, does anyone have any burning question you want to ask here? <laughs> all right, right there. Okay. All right. Unless fine. you want to answer it. No, I mean, I can't really, I, I'm not there, I'm not, not at Yahweh anymore, so, um, but I would say that um, David is still there, in fact, um, uh, David is, uh, uh, David and, and Marissa have uh, uh, really found a way to, to uh, work well together, and David is extremely positive about what's going on in the company, so um, he, he, he's on the board. And my um, very simple rule when I left was, hey, David, you're the founder now. Um, if, you, if your thumb is up, I'm totally supportive, and if you have any issues you want to talk to me about, I'm, I'm here. Um, so they talk to me from time to time, but we don't really talk about anything that's, quote unquote, you know, inside information. So I don't really know what's going on other than David is really happy there, and he um, is a big believer in the company. Um, any last questions? Go ahead. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that um, the question about consolidation or the fragmentation, I think, and um, I, I think that we're entering a phase where you, you obviously have these, you know, mega companies like Apple and Google and Facebook, um, and then you have a whole other tier of uh, and Alibaba and, and, and Tencent and, and, and to some extent Baidu, and I think they're um, they're going to continue to consolidate. They're, they're the large consolidators in the business. In the enterprise world, you still have very large enterprise companies, but what you also are seeing some, some great new upstarts. I'm on the board of a company called Workday, and um, this sort of cloud-based uh, SaaS enterprise is um, a really hot, but also I think a very fertile area for a lot of disruption. Um, my, my sense is that um, with mobility, with um, the, the app world becoming um, um, really still pretty diversified. You have two main platforms with Android and iOS. You're, you're going to continue to see um, a lot of innovation on the app side, especially with devices and Internet of Things. Um, and I, I, I do believe that um, on, the, on the enterprise side, you're going to just see um, every industry being sort of uh, brought to the cloud, leveraging mobility. Um, and I think you're going to continue to see, I think Luke mentioned it earlier, um, that uh, commerce is going to be more and more core. And when you have payment built in and, and into more and more devices, I think it's just going to create even more flow. So, um, so I would say that you know, uh, fragmentation is probably going to continue. Uh, um, but I do think that the big players are, are controlling a huge part of the ecosystem now. Um, but because there's so much um, entrepreneur activity, because there's so much effort to open source a lot of the core and relying capabilities um, that I do think that uh, the, um, the idea, and, and, and I, I know that the big companies have to kind of keep their eyes on the smaller companies, they can't ignore them anymore. So the outreach that all the big companies are doing um, for all the entrepreneurs is unprecedented. And uh, a lot of our smaller companies in our portfolio are able to do corporate development or business development deals with large non-tech companies, uh, retailers or manufacturers or whatever. And those are things that, you know, 15, 10 years ago, you never heard of a PNG doing a, a deal with a small company. Um, so I think, I think everybody in the world now, you know, GE on down, is paying attention to what's going on here in the Valley. And I think that's a, a, a hugely positive thing. Um, and hopefully that encourages even more innovation. All right, so with that, thank uh, you very let's much. thank Jerry for coming out. to the second uh, batch of companies. The next uh, group is fantastic, so we're really excited for them. Uh, so um, with that, we'll call it Novo Ed. Novo Ed is
is solving the most pressing problem right now in online education, engagement. Without engagement, there's no foundation to build learning outcomes or job skills. Now, there's a lot of folks in the ed tech space right now, and they're trying to take this experience largely and replicate it online. And we think they're being pretty successful. <laughs> now, there's a fundamental flaw in where these folks start. They start from the technology. It's easy to put videos and multiple choice quizzes online, and quizzes do a great job in terms of feeding data into your big data algorithms, but they miss the most important part of education, which is the motivation of the learner. Now, there's 50 years of research in teaching and learning that says education to be effective must be experiential and social and address the motivation of the learner. This is what NovaWeb does. We essentially bring Web 2.0 putting the learner at the center, putting their experiences and their work product as being part of the educational experience. And that's just as important in the educational experience as the professional videos by the instructors. We use teamwork and projects to get people to come together. And there's this magic thing that happens which we call felt accountability. In other words, if I'm working on a team with you, I feel accountable to you for doing a high quality job in the class. In other words, my engagement goes up dramatically when I'm doing the educational experience with other folks. Now, NovaWed started as an internal project here at Stanford in the social algorithms lab, where they were studying, well, why does Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, why do they work? What are the incentives that are driving this underlying social networking behavior? In 2013, we spun out, and now we're really starting to grow. So we've doubled our team in the last six months. We've raised five million in venture capital funding. And we've had over 600,000 learners go through our application, and they've participated in 250,000 teams. Now, also unlike a lot of online learning platforms out there, we have a business model. We've already booked over a million dollars this year. Here's one example of a project we're working on. We partnered up with the Stars Foundation in London to create a philanthropy university. The goal of this university is to use the power of online education to deliver to NGOs and nonprofit leaders around the world great education that allows them to impact 100 million people by 2020. We're partnering up with the Stanford PACS, the Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society. And one of the interesting components of this, we're not just a technology platform. We're actually partnering with our customers to help them build their online businesses. In this case, we're actually leading the charge of creating a strategy and the curriculum around Philanthropy University. Here's some of our other partners. We work with five of the top 10 business schools in the country and many other folks like the Carnegie Foundation who are really leaders in pedagogy and thinking through effective education. I hope to see you out there in the booths afterwards. We're looking for engineers who want to be a major contributor on a smart agile development team who are looking to help us solve the hard problem in education engagement and are frankly willing to step up to a very high level of standard by elite education such as the Stanford Business School and the Wharton Business School. And at the end of the day, if we're successful, we're going to help millions of people realize their potential through online education. Now, we're not just hiring engineers, we're also hiring business development folks and folks in instructional programs. Thanks. I just want to just, uh, say just a few seconds on why we're part of StartX. So I've had people ask me, hey, Clint, why are you part of StartX? By the way, I've been in startups for 20 years now. I've started four companies in Silicon Valley, I've been a venture capitalist, and for the last five years I've taught entrepreneurship in the engineering school over here at Stanford. And in short, I'm part of StartX, StartX because speed wins. There's a lot of things that StartX does, and you know, I've got my own network, my team has their own network. We could replicate these things on our own, but not nearly as quickly and not nearly in as high quality way. So in my mind, I want to give my company every possible chance of success, and that means being part of StartX. So next up, we have AJ from Dispatcher. So we've all been hearing quite a bit about Uber recently. But what if there was actually a much bigger opportunity in transportation technology? There actually is. It's in long haul trucking. Go with me for a moment and take a look at the numbers. As you can see, this is a huge industry, particularly relative to what we hear a lot about today. Now, why does this matter? That's the space we're focused on. So Dispatcher is kind of like Uber, but for long-haul trucking. 
Before we get into the details, uh, I'd like to take a sec to kind of tell you a quick story. The story centers around Alex. Alex is a truck driver. He's not your typical truck driver. He doesn't have a beard, and he does have a smartphone. Turns out, about 80% of truck drivers today have smartphones, and there's a lot of them. A subset of them, about 200,000, are what we call independent owner operators. And these are folks who literally own their own truck and drive around. Alex is in Kansas. They drive around and look for shipments all day to deliver. In a completely different world, Greg is a VP of operations at a produce company down in Salinas, California. Greg serves a lot of different customers, and his job is to get his fresh produce to those customers every day without a hitch. The problem is that he has about 50 truckloads of fresh produce coming in and out of his warehouse every day. So what's painful about this? A lot of things, but in particular, for Alex, finding loads is hard. For folks who are familiar with this problem, <laughs> Alex is literally the traveling salesman. At any moment, he has a near infinite number of options to maximize his personal revenue and well-being. And he has to make those calculations and decisions in his head, which we all know is a little bit challenging. Second problem is coordination. Greg and Alex had a difficult time getting together to do this. Here's a little bit of detail on the process. It happens through a complicated set of intermediaries known as freight brokers, through a horrible system of phone calling, back and forth negotiations, and a little bit of paperwork every time they want to do a shipment. This is about the amount of time and friction it takes today to do that. Third big problem, trust and transparency. This is the kind of folks that Alex gets to deal with when he's trying to find a shipment. And for Greg, he never knows where Alex is because he has to call his freight broker to find out. So his warehouse manager is constantly on the phone. So what we're building is a system that matches these two more efficiently than they can be today. And Kevin's going to tell you a little bit more about that. We've got a web application and a set of APIs that the shippers use to post shipments directly onto our platform. We then turn around and dispatch those stops directly onto the trucker's smartphones. And the way the system works is that our backend intelligently routes the different shipments and then coordinates the individual truck drivers solely using their smartphone. As a result, there is no more paperwork that needs to be filled out. There are no more emails that need to be sent back and forth. And finally, that allows us to drastically reduce the amount of time that it takes to close a transaction. We are right now live in both app stores. We've got hundreds of active truckers using our application. And we're doing real and actual transactions every single week. And here's a little bit about the team and why you should join us. Age of Balance is the CEO and co-founder of Dispatcher. He used to be the lead product manager of a Series A funded startup. He also did corporate strategy for Disney and is right now in his second degree at Stanford University. Kevin is a lifelong software engineer. He grew up in Germany and was building operating systems as a nine-year-old in his garage. Uh, after that, he moved to the US, started his own software company, and actually did test bit automation and GPS software for the automobile industry. And we met at Stanford. So like many others, we're looking for talented folks to join the team. Uh, we're a Series C funded company, and we're looking for excited full stack engineers who are passionate about working on cutting edge technology, and the mean stack in particular. Uh, we'd love to talk to you after this at our booth outside. And a couple of words on why, how we've been involved in StartX. So we actually got started with StartX about a year ago. Uh, we took our company to Startup Weekend, which is coming up in about four weeks. It's an amazing event where you can actually work with a team of uh, volunteers from around campus on your idea for a weekend. Uh, we won the event, and then we were admitted to the program this summer, to the incubator program for StartX. And it's been amazing. Uh, we're, I'm a GSB student, and it's been an amazing opportunity to connect with other alums and Stanford community members out in the world for funding, hiring, and really great mentorship. So happy to talk more about that afterwards as well. Thank you. I'm introducing Mike with the phone. Hi everyone, it's uh, great to see so many people here interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, my name is Mike Thumb. Uh, I guess I'll get slides in a sec. Yeah, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of a company called Diplot. So we are an AI startup of 12 people. Uh, we're working about a block from the Stanford campus. Um, for those of you that don't know, we were actually one of the 
Uh, we were the first StartX company, so it's great to be back here and see how the program has grown. Uh, our team is comprised of uh, experts in uh, deep learning, uh, computer vision, natural language processing. It's a team that's been assembled from all around the world. Uh, our company was seed funded by Andy Bettelstein. Uh, he was the founder of Sun Microsystems and notably the first investor in Google. Uh, unlike a lot of other AI startups, uh, we have actually a launched product and uh, we have a, a technology and API that both uh, small startups as well as you know, four to 10 companies use uh, to, uh, to get the structured information. Um, what our API does, uh, if you guys have ever used like Instapaper or done comparison shopping on uh, major search engines or product pinning sites, uh, you've actually probably already seen Diffbot data. So we power all of these um, services behind the scenes. Uh, Diffbot is essentially uh, this AI, uh, this bot we've written that is able to look at web pages and much like a human being does, uh, automatically uh, look at the page and be able to tell what it is, parse the page, uh, understand, A, this is a product page, extract out the, end, the uh, fields of that product, it's product price, SKU, MPN, you know, um, the uh, image of the product, the reviews, who's left the reviews. So it does a lot of the work that humans do when they, when they read the web pages and it emits this as structured data. The goal of a company is to convert uh, the entire web of documents we have today into a uh, web of structured information. Uh, so if you, if you guys have ever seen like the movie um, Her or Lucy or that Johnny Depp movie earlier this year, uh, in all three of these films, uh, there was a pivotal point in the movie where the AI connects to the internet and then after that it knows everything and that's when uh, it becomes really evil or you know, decides to ditch his human boyfriend. Uh, that, that, you know, how did that happen? It's not just because that AI you know, has like a, you know, a subscription to Comcast and can download web pages. Uh, it's because that AI has a subscription to DivBot and is able to tap into the entire universe of structured data, process that structured data and its algorithms, and then use that to compute you know, how it's, it's planned for taking over the world. So, in short, you know, join us, uh, help us build Skynet. If you're building uh, your own, um, if you're building your own AI startup or you're interested in that field, um, like Luke was saying before, you know, folks like uh, Bill Gates, you know, Elon Musk have said that AI is the single most important engineering problem that uh, we should be working on today. So we need more folks like that. Uh, come talk to me if you're interested in joining or if you just like advice from a startup, an AI startup, you know, that successfully built a great team, uh, raised some money, and also uh, shipped a product. Thanks a lot.
Our CTO used to be the director of engineering at Sony Mobile, and he's also an expert in both computer vision and 3D modeling. One of our lead investors is a professor here at Stanford University in the physics department, Dr. Xu Xing Zhang. And I'll leave you guys with one last teaser. So companies like Google and Apple mapped the entire outside world, modeled it, and then created immense business value for themselves. So imagine what we can do if we map the entire inside world. We're thrilled about our technology and our business. We're hiring across the board. So please come talk to me at our booth afterwards. Thank you so much. Because you're surrounded by all of these amazing people, right? 
And I was super excited, and it was literally the best time of my life. And then, no one told me that when I graduated, all my friends would spread across the world, and for no reason besides the fact we weren't physically close together, they would effectively leave my life. And it was really sad, because I have all these amazing friends, and we have all this technology. We have Facebook, we have text, we have phone, we have Skype, but it still doesn't feel like we live in the dorm again together. So I thought about this a lot, and what I realized was, you know, I feel I, like I'm happy for my, one of my freshmen, Sarah, when I was just on staff, when she posts on Facebook saying she got a new job. But what really brought us close was when she would run back to Soto and tell me, oh my god, I just want this 14-hour first date, here are all the details, right? So we thought about this and said, how do we build a product that fosters authentic relationships by letting you be emotionally vulnerable and share the day-changing events in your life? So we built OMG. So it's basically what it does. We're launching soon, so you guys will hear about it. Um, so keep like keep your eyes out. And we also raised a bunch of money. We're hiring awesome iOS and Android engineers and designers, but not just engineers and designers. We truly want people who care about human relationships, building communities, and human psychology. Cool. So that's about our company. And while it's Cameron asked me to talk here, I was trying to think about when I was sitting in that seat right there like a couple years ago, what would I have wanted to hear? So I like racked my brains, I thought about it, I talked to some people, and put together my list on what like the lessons I've learned over the last year that really helped me. So here we go, it's three parts. So it's called Nikhil's List on How to Win at Being an Entrepreneur. Okay, so step number one. Every successful entrepreneur I've talked to, and in my own experience of starting companies over the last several years, the people are hands down the most important thing. And I think you guys heard Jerry Yang talk about this. And so I was a Facebook, I was a product manager at Facebook, Google, Microsoft during my summers at Stanford. And every single one of these companies I went to, they always said, hey Nikhil, this is going to be the greatest set of people, the most intelligent, most fun people you'll ever be around. And in my head, I didn't say this out loud, but in my head I said, you know, they're awesome, but Stanford is like a whole other level. And truly, the people that I've been around at Stanford, the people that you guys are here around, are literally the best of the best of the best, and the best of the most fun of the best. So definitely, definitely take advantage of that while you're here. Um, I found my co-founder Joe when we were TA databases together because these people, like get to know people, get to work with them, because these people will be your closest friends, they're going to be the people who change the whole world, and most importantly, they're going to be your future teammates. Second, just do it. So many of the great entrepreneurs I've talked to, like everyone says the Stanford culture is like amazing about entrepreneurship, everyone talks about it, and all the great entrepreneurs I've met definitely talk about entrepreneurship, but the thing that sets them apart is that they actually do stuff. From a young age, they're building, they're creating, they're making, right? So none of us ever think about Mark as that loser who built eight things before he built one thing that succeeded, right? But we just think of him as the guy who made Facebook. So, and I, I think Jerry talks about this also. Jerry said, you know, Yahoo wasn't their main idea. They're thinking about other ideas, but they're just building stuff on the side. And personally, for me also, the biggest things I've made, the most successful things I've made, were things that were like, I was just bored on a winter break and decided to code with some of my friends. So, really, just go out there, go home after I finish this talk, and go build something awesome and share it with your friends. It's the most rewarding feeling in the world. And finally, environment. And like we talked about, you know, Stanford is like one of the most amazing set of people you've ever met in your whole life. And the journey of entrepreneurship is a really difficult one. It's really difficult. It's like emotionally, it's an emotional roller coaster on a daily basis. And what you find is your normal support group, your mom, your girlfriend, your sister, your friends, will be there. They'll support you. They'll, they'll root for you. But they don't really understand what it's like to go through this. So what I found is super valuable for me is to surround myself with a set of peers who are going through the same thing, who are starting their own companies. And, and I, I found this personally through StartX, which I also already talked about. You guys know how much I love Stanford. Um, but I already talked about how it's such an awesome community. What StartX does is it filters those people and says, which one of you awesome, awesome people are really excited about entrepreneurship, are excited about starting your own company, and are really serious about it? You take them together, put them in a building, make them like lifelong friends, and help each other out on the journey. So it's been an extremely rewarding ride and I've like been so happy I've been part of this community. So if you're thinking about starting your own company, go for it. It's gonna be a lot of work, it's gonna be really difficult, and it's gonna be the most fun you've ever had in your life. And just make sure you surround yourself with great people. Finally, I've had a lot of people help me along the way, so I would love if any of you guys want help on your company, want ideas on how to fundraise, or just wanna hang out, like shoot me an email, we'll grab coffee, well I don't really drink coffee, we'll grab Java juice, and we'll hang out. So thank you for your time and have a great day. Yes.
So first of all, my name is Kathy. I'm part of the EdCast team. I also was a Stanford student, and I just found out today that I uh, beat Jerry on this one. I do have a PhD. So I am uh, an unusual candidate here. Um, the business school is great, and what we really want to do is thank StartX. It's been a terrific support for EdCast in its very early stage, and really lots of connections, lots of support, and it's been a really uh, key ingredient to the success. Today, I am channeling Carl Letta, who is a serial entrepreneur. He's the founder and the CEO of EdCast. He is traveling today, so unfortunately, he cannot be here. I'm trying to fill his very, very big shoes. So EdCast is really about cloud based knowledge. It's about knowledge sharing in the cloud. It's about taking the ideas that we've been able to do online, but really making it go global. It's about marrying the ideas of social uh, learning, and it's also ma marrying those ideas with scale. So this is really important time in online learning for those of you who have been following it. It takes the ideas that uh, we've been able to do at some level, but haven't really been able to do at scale. And with the knowledge base, we can really do that now. It takes a little bit of the paradox and the shift of marrying two things, personalization with scale and with global access. And this is really a unique contribution that EdCast is doing. It's working with institutions, instructors, governments, and it's working with uh, enterprise as well. Anyone who really wants to get together and collaborative, collaboratively share in online learning. We um, have just launched. It was in a stealth period for a year, so many of you probably have not heard about it. Really just got announced about two weeks ago. There's a lot of buzz around it. Look at Google, look at Twitter. I think you'll see the streams and you'll see really about the success and some of the excitement that's really happening around Incast. This is one of our customer stories. This is Jeffrey Stack, Sachs. He's a professor at Columbia University. Many of you may know him. He started the Earth Institute. Um, and he's also leading a course with 250 institutions on the EdCast platform on sustainable development and solutions for the network. 250 institutions are coming together kind of under his leadership and they can also distribute the knowledge to their membership as well. In, a different in addition to uh, Jeffrey who's joined EdCast, there's a number of others who have joined very quickly. One of them is the Open Education Consortium. It's a consortium of over 300 universities across the world who are committed to knowledge sharing worldwide. We are hiring. We have had a very successful Series A round. We are funded by SoftBank and Menlo Ventures, among others. We are looking for talent. We are close by. We're just not far here from the Stanford campus. We're in Mountain View, close to Google. If uh, you are interested, if you have talent, if you're interested in this space, please, please come. Uh, let us know about it. Either contact us through the uh, account, the email, or feel free to find me out front. Thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce Jeff from Locke, who's next up here.
there's really this growing of uh, the connected wearable space and of iPhones uh, tracking your, uh, your activity. And we wanted to ride that train and take our coaching that we developed on Lark and expand it to all of the other aspects of your day. So uh, that's the product that I want to talk to you about today, which is uh, what's coming up. So I think all of us know the basic challenges of health and wellness. You know, we're very interested, not in necessarily in the, uh, medical health, but in consumer health. You know, the, the challenges here are really about everyday problems. Um, you know, it's about building positive habits. It's about doing the right thing every day. You know, the, the tasks at hand are simple. Get active, sleep more, stress less, eat healthier. And uh, the, the challenge really is just doing it every, every day, day in and day out. And uh, the problem is that most of us end up giving up, you know, whether it's on a, on a particular diet or whether it's with a device that we've used. You know, we've, we've used a lot of the products out there, you know, Fitbit and, and a lot of these other products, and we think they're, they're interesting, but they're not, quite, they're not quite there yet. You know, they give you a lot of numbers and a lot of data, but it somehow isn't treating you like a human being. It's kind of treating you like you're a robot that needs to walk 10,000 steps. And so we said, you know, what if there were a more enjoyable, friendly, intuitive, simple way? And so that's what, that's what we've been working on for, uh, for the past several months. Uh, I'd love to show you the product, but unfortunately, um, press is not, our PR team is not allowing us just yet. Uh, but it's launching on Monday. And uh, the, you know, we're really excited about it because it's building off of what we, what we created uh, and launched with Samsung on all S5 phones globally uh, pre-installed. And it's basically a smart, intelligent health, uh, health uh, assistant, a buddy, if you will, you know. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, going live with some really cool new features on iOS 8 and HealthKit. And uh, we think that it's going to be a pretty exciting launch. And so, uh, you know, we at LARC, we really believe in the power of technology to transform people's lives not only from the perspective of helping them get healthier and have healthier habits, but also in actually changing their mindsets. And so I'd be happy to show you how we do that on the actual product outside. Um, and so if you are interested and you believe in this, uh, this possibility, this mission too, come on by. And um, yeah, thanks to Stardex, and uh, that's it. So I'll now introduce uh, Kathleen from uh, all right, thank you guys so much for staying till the end. We're, we're almost over, so I brought you one more t-shirt. <laughs> Alright, uh, I'm Kathleen. I'm the founder of Ascension, uh, and uh, I'm a CS student here at Stanford, and I'm here to talk about our collaboration. Uh, with the wall lab at the School of Medicine. And uh, I want to start this with the story of somebody who's very dear to my heart. Uh, this is David, and like one in 42 boys, David has been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And so one of the things that he struggles with are faces, reading facial expressions, and some of the social cues that we take for granted when we look somebody in the eyes, David actually has to learn. Uh, and so his dad recalls this beautiful story of how every evening when when the family would go to sleep, they would all stand up in front of the bathroom mirror together, and everyone would make faces, and David would be the one while they're brushing their teeth, pinpointing them. I think that's a really beautiful example of how training of facial expressions can work in autism. But unfortunately, that's not quite the norm. The preventing approach of behavioral therapy is flashcards. Happy, sad. But the problem is that the way I smile and the way that little girl smiles are actually quite different. So what if we could take this the same learning effect, take it to the real world, and give people feedback and social views right then and there. And that's exactly what we've done. We've developed a Google Glass app that reads facial expressions using computer vision technology and helps kids with autism train how to read them right then and there. So let me try to show you. This is Nick. You've got to see what uh, he sees through Glass. Too loud to count. 
outside litter and put it on and try it yourself. Uh, to do this, we've developed some pretty lightweight face tracking technology um, and expression recognition technology based on a 3D face tracker. We continuously learn on a person's neutral face, and what it allows us to do is to adapt to different people and recognize expressions in all kinds of different life conditions. In addition to that, uh, we're also taking data from a small eye tracker that we're testing right now. And what that allows us to do is, while we're tracking expressions of me, of, of, of people that I look at wearing the glass, we can also track my eye gaze, how I relate to them, and when I'm looking at them or when I'm not looking at them. So what that results in is we get this data from all these different sensors, eye tracking of me, outward expression recognition, head tracking through Google Glass, and we can now come up with complex social cues. So the next time that David gets into a rant and he keeps talking and talking and the person across from him makes less and less and less eye contact, we can cue him by saying, pause ask a question. And at the same time, we can gather the data about how David is interacting with these people when he's looking at them, how much eye contact he's making, and how he's improving with those as measurables that we can bring back into behavioral therapy, hopefully increase the learning process, and then take glass off again. We're just about to start clinical trials as a nonprofit project uh, with the Wall Lab. And uh, if you're interested in helping out with this, we're looking to hire in a couple of positions, especially people with a machine learning background. Um, if you're interested in doing your honors thesis or something like that with, that, uh, with us, we're open to that as well. So just come be us outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so once we get Kevin's project, uh, or, or, um, um, product, we'd be able to look at the audience and see when people are really bored and anxious. And so uh, that would be helpful. We can feed you uh, sugar. Um, anyway, that was the end of the presentations. Um, you know, we have everything from hardware companies to enterprise to consumer internet companies. One of the groups that we didn't have present as much because a lot of them are in the labs are the biotech companies. So I just wanted to make a shout out to them. We have some companies working on epigenomics, on genetic sequencing, one that raised $40 million. Others are working on cellular biology, all the way over to micro, micro fluorescent tracking, the chair of the chemistry department. So we support all types of companies, founders of all stages. So uh, we're really looking forward to seeing what projects you all come up with. And uh, we have booths out back. And by the way, we have a box of t-shirts. Uh, if you guys just want to go and grab a t-shirt, you're to, for free. No charge. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming again, and enjoy the demo booths.